Like much of Nicholas Winding Refn's work, there's a disparity between Only God Forgives marketing and the finished product, which would have left a lot of audiences confused and frustrated, especially since a lot of those audiences would have been watching off the back of Refn's previous film, Drive. If I drive for you, you give me a time and a place, I give you a five minute window. Anything happens in that five minutes and I'm yours, no matter what. I don't sit in while you're running it down, I don't carry a gun. I drive. But among those people, there were more than a few, me among them, who nevertheless find Only God Forgives compelling in a way that's hard to describe. And so those of us who stuck around to think about the film long after everyone else moved on found numerous questions and ideas to be unpacked. Ten years later, for me the most interesting question for how it both is and is not important is the question, hey, is that retired Bangkok policeman really the Old Testament God? At first glance, Only God Forgives is a crime or a revenge thriller which marks the second collaboration between director Nicholas Winding Refn and actor Ryan Gosling. It came off the back of 2011's surprise sleeper hit Drive, which propelled Refn into the mainstream and subsequently earned Only God Forgives an amount of attention it otherwise probably wouldn't have received. But reception to the finished film was mixed, tending towards negative, in part because Only God Forgives is honestly better in concept than it is in execution, but mainly because it wasn't what audiences had been led to expect. There were parallels between Only God Forgives and Drive which suggested that the former would be a spiritual successor to the latter. A Drive 2.0 if you will. There's the fact that Gosling is playing a variation on a character. In Only God Forgives, he's a man with anger issues who doesn't talk much but is good at punching. Kind of. And in Drive, he's a man with anger issues who doesn't talk much but is good at driving. And you'd believe it if Refn told you they're the same person. And there's the fact that both movies are about violence and violent men, and that both take place in a criminal underworld, but that's about it. Where Drive is a comparatively straight genre piece based on a comically pulp novel. Maybe he should turn around, go back and tell them that's what life was. A long series of things that didn't go down the way you thought they would. Hell with it. Either they'd figure it out or they wouldn't. Most people never did. Only God Forgives is closer in spirit to reference Valhalla Rising, meaning that it's more of a mood piece than a film, with its themes and ideas suggested or implied, and exposition handled largely by dream sequences and visions, and with a lot of heavy symbolism. Which is of course not to say that symbolism doesn't have its place, but the symbolism in Only God Forgives is often too much for a 90 minute film. It's at once somehow both blunt and impenetrable. So summaries of Only God Forgives tend to retreat towards the safe territory of words and terms like criminal underworld and revenge, and in general reinforce the idea that Only God Forgives is a genre piece. Again, a Drive 2.0. Julian, a drug smuggler thriving in Bangkok's criminal underworld, sees his life get even more complicated when his mother compels him to find and kill whoever is responsible for his brother's recent death. So that's the official summary from the IMDb page, and it reads like it was written by somebody who didn't watch the film, or didn't get the symbolism, or the most likely scenario, has been forced to compact this abstract film about violence and incest and family abuse which is set against a criminal thriller background into a single paragraph. Which isn't to say that it's wrong, just that it's kind of a shallow take and one that's never going to get close to what the film is really about. So yes, the inciting incident in Only God Forgives is Billy's murder. And yes, Billy's murder compels Crystal to come to Bangkok, where she in turn compels Julian to find the murderer. These things are factually correct. 
But they're also misleading. Billy's murder is not the catalyst for a revenge thriller, but a jumping off point for talking about Julian's internalized anger, his incestuous and abusive relationship with his mother Crystal, and his attempts to find atonement through his symbolic god figure. Julian and Billy are more like mirror reflections of each other. Like Billy, Julian is consumed with rage and anger that all stems from his relationship with Crystal. And like Billy, Julian has the violent energy coiled up inside him that he has no way to deal with and which ultimately suggests to Julian that Billy deserved his punishment because he, Julian, deserves to be punished. It's a little more complicated than that, Mother. Meaning what exactly? Billy raped and killed a 16-year-old girl. All of which is to say that Billy's murder isn't a precursor to Julian's revenge story, because Julian doesn't want revenge. I let him go. Rather, it's a setup to bring Julian into the orbit of Lieutenant Chang, a retired policeman known as the Angel of Vengeance who may or may not be the literal Old Testament god and who is really into eye for an eye style justice. In that symbolic role, Chang would therefore have the authority to judge Julian, to pass sentence on his crimes, and by extension, absolve him of those crimes. In other words, Chang is the symbolic god Julian needs, if he can get Chang to care. Chang does not care. So there is then a dissonance between the genre aesthetics of Only God Forgives and its supernatural and symbolic elements. A dissonance that's not helped by marketing and single paragraph summaries. It's perhaps this dissonance which has led many people to grasp at the film's more concrete, more literal details and ask questions like, what is Only God Forgives about? And how many lines does Ryan Gosling speak? 17 if you're interested. But the most interesting question, because it turns out to be both not important and very important, is the question, is Chang really God? So it's certainly true that Chang, if not literally, then symbolically embodies the character traits and the ethos of Old Testament God meaning that he's really into eye for an eye style justice. And it's true that Chang has this supernatural aura and this air of inevitability which inspires a religious reverence and awe in the men who follow him and which manifests in the way he for example, pulls a sword from his back out of nowhere. But as to whether or not Chang is literally God, the short answer is, I don't know, because it's not actually important. Or rather, the literal implications of the answer aren't important. Truth be told, in terms of story, not much changes if Chang is or is not literally God. Now, there are, of course, implications, such as where the sword comes from if Chang's not God, but then, as far as I know, Old Testament God is not a retired police officer from Thailand, doesn't have a thing for karaoke, and tends not to hand out direct personal justice with a catch in da. So things like where the sword comes from seem like non sequiturs either way. But within the film's metaphor of a man who wants and needs God's forgiveness, the question, is Chang God, becomes very important. So Chang is something of an inevitable force of nature, or a nemesis, but not to Julian, who Chang does not care about, <laughs> rather to Julian's mother, Crystal. So here's an interesting thing. Only God Forgives had the potential to say some interesting things about the cycle of violence and the way that violence begets more violence, and that's certainly how it reads if you catalogue the events chronologically. 
Billy murders a prostitute and in the name of eye for an eye style justice, Chang allows the prostitute's father to murder Billy. This sets off a chain of more violence in which Crystal orders the death of the prostitute's father in retribution and then causes the deaths of several innocent people while trying to assassinate Chang. Chang responds in kind by killing the would-be assassin, torturing the guy who ordered the assassination in Only God Forgives most horrific scene. <laughs> Along the way, one of Chang's own police officers and his daughter's nanny are murdered. Chang's daughter survives only thanks to Julian's last minute intervention. And yet the film doesn't seem interested in the cycle of violence. And in fact, it doesn't have anything to say about violence, except that it is violent. Chang's actions aren't examined or questioned, and the event which closes the cycle of violence at the film's end is itself a violent act. As to why the violence is never examined, well a lot of it is an extension of Chang's authority and his conviction in his own methods. So apocryphal evidence has it that Refn would whisper things like, you are God, into Vithea Panzingham's ear before filming. True or not, the point of the anecdote is that Refn wanted Pan Zingom to believe that Chang is God because Chang needs to believe that he is God. That certainty in his own identity as God gives Chang the divine right to hand out Old Testament style justice because without it he would be just a vigilante. A retired policeman hitting people with frying pans, arbitrarily removing limbs, killing people on a personal whim, and kind of, sort of inspiring a gang war on the streets of Bangkok. Let's just say that Chang has a vested interest in being God. But he's not the only one. So with that in mind, let's talk about fists. So Julian's personality and character and motivation are all represented symbolically through his fists, meaning they're a physical manifestation of Julian's guilt and shame and rage and sexual impotence because in Refn's world, violence and sex appear to be the same thing or they're related or Refn is turned on by violence. I'm not really sure, his interviews can get a little weird. And then it was an idea that gave me, oh my God, the act of penetrating your mother is very erotic, which a lot of the movie is about, of course, is our, the man's repulsiveness to his mother's sexuality, yet at the same time being aroused by it. As a result, a lot of this is going to be conjecture because you need to work it out from the little that's presented on screen, or you need to go watch a bunch of reference interviews because most of Only God Forgives subtext is itself buried deep within its own subtext. For example, the karaoke scenes likely won't make a lot of sense if you don't understand or aren't at least aware that music is an important part of Southeastern Asian spiritualism and that Refn became aware of this fact during filming. So a lot of this subtext within subtext is because Refn tends to put his films together on the fly. Now he's pretty open about deferring to his actors about motivations and scenes, and he's equally open to changing the meaning of his films on that basis, to the point at which he'll casually throw out and rewrite large portions of his scripts mid-shoot. And then, um, um, I, so I say to Ryan, so Ryan, so, you, so your mom's dead, what do you want to do, cry? <laughs> Laugh, what do you want to do? Ryan goes, I don't know. Slice her stomach open, pull out her womb. Yeah, you want to do that? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> I can make that work. Refn has talked about how he likes to find the meaning of his films on set or even in the edit. Like he'll just suddenly realize what he's making a film about. And this is probably why a lot of Refn's output is heavily symbolic and abstract and ethereal, and probably why he spends a lot of time in interviews explaining his films. They're at once somehow both simple and impenetrable because much of what they're about is realized by the director during or after the fact. Well, it's what I do when we're done shooting, I basically put the film together in complete different ways just to analyze what the material could do, meaning what by adding one scene to another scene and then turning it around, adding a third one, what, what comes as subtext in between each scene. 
Julian's guilt is a good example of this process in action. It's there in the subtext and it's important thematically, but a lot of it is there just by suggestion and maybe even by coincidence. And here we're talking about the suggestion that Julian beat his own father to death and maybe probably did so at the instigation of his own mother. Now, if true, it provides a lot of context for Julian's relationship with his own fists and the reason why he sees so much of his negative and destructive tendencies represented in his fists. And it explains why Julian might be so interested in the man who judiciously chops off limbs. But this fact is only brought up once by Crystal as an attempt to throw Julian under the bus to save her own life. It pains me to say this to you, as it would pain any mother. But he killed his own father with his bare hands. Now, if you want to reach a little further, you could argue on rewatch that the look Billy and Julian share in the film's opening suggests the fraught relationship you might have if, I don't know, your brother beat your father to death. But that really is reaching because Julian's father isn't brought up in any context anywhere else. So it's an idea that's hinted at, but never fully established. And that seems to be because Refn seems more interested in establishing Julian's shame. Shame which stems from the incestuous relationship he has with his mother. As a result of this shame, any attempts at intimacy with Mai bring intrusive thoughts of Crystal, which in turn leaves Julian sexually frustrated impotent and crucially angry enough to want to go punch things. And so he has my bind his hands to the arms of a chair or he keeps himself at a physical distance because he knows that if he doesn't it will lead him to take out his anger on my the way Billy took out his anger on the prostitute. But containing the rage doesn't mean the rage is gone and since Julian can't take it out on the object of the anger, meaning Crystal herself, and because he has no other emotional outlet for the anger, it's inevitable that, just like Billy, he's going to take it out on someone sometime. Which means this guy. This random guy who gets a glass in the face simply for being there. So you can understand why Julian has a special interest in Chang, because Julian has channeled his negative, most destructive impulses and emotions symbolically into his fists, and Chang, as the angel of vengeance and a potential god figure, is known for judiciously removing limbs. All of which ultimately makes Julian's story the story of a man trying to get God's attention. You want to fight? Now what Julian wants to do with that attention is less clear. Does he want God to punish him? Does he want to provoke God? Is he just lashing out in anger and frustration? Well, Refn has said that the idea for the film came from an existential crisis he himself experienced following the difficult birth of his second child. And from that crisis grew the idea of a man who wants to fight God, only the man doesn't fully understand why, this after all being an existential crisis. But the question remains, when Julian asks Chang if he wants to fight, does Julian want to take out his anger on Chang, his potential symbolic god figure? Does he want to provoke Chang into a reaction? And exactly how conscious is he of his reasons? Well, there's a clue in an earlier draft of the script. And in this draft, the fight between Julian and Chang is very different. In it, Julian beats up Chang pretty much unopposed until Chang decides that he's had enough. Chang then beats up Julian and having beaten him, whispers, I forgive you into Julian's ear. Now framed in this way, Julian's motives appear to be driven by provocation. He appears to want to provoke God into a reaction so that God will punish him and subsequently forgive him. That this version of the script was changed is likely because God, in the form of Chang, has no reason at this point to punish Julian or even to care at all for Julian. Chang's personal jurisdiction begins and ends with the murdered prostitute and the consequences of her death, which Julian has had nothing to do with. So yeah, in the fight scene as it's presented, Chang beats Julian easily, but it doesn't provide closure and he doesn't give Julian absolution or forgiveness because he has no personal reason to. 
It's not even a fight so much as Chang just toying with Julian. And all of this suggests that this is why Julian, who until now has kind of just existed alongside the film's plot, becomes active in what has essentially become a feud. Now, disappointed, let down and humiliated by his symbolic god, Julian goes with Charlie to kill Chang on the orders of Crystal. But when Charlie tells Julian that they're also going to murder Chang's daughter, Julian has a moment of... I guess it's self-realization or pity or maybe just basic humanity. And in that moment, he kills Charlie before Charlie can kill Chang's daughter. Now this sequence of events, encompassing breaking and entering and the murders of a police officer and Chang's daughter's nanny, turns out, fortuitously for Julian, to be just the level of crime which dictates the judicious removal of arms. So yay, I guess you got God's attention. Good job, Julian. And so here we are at Fulham's End with Julian in a forest clearing, his fists upraised in submission, awaiting the judgment and punishment of his symbolic God which Chang duly finally provides. Just like that. To ask if Chang is God is to ask the wrong question. This is a story about a man who, in the midst of an existential crisis, seeks redemption from God who appears to him in the symbolic form of Lieutenant Chang. It doesn't matter if Chang is God, only that Julian believes him to be God so that Chang can carry out the symbolic function of God. Because Julian needs to be rid of his shame and his guilt and his anger, he needs to atone, but he's not going to find atonement in the material world. Because the material world includes an abusive, incestuous mother, a crime syndicate whose members aren't big on self-reflection, and an older brother who serves only as a warning for what Julian is and could become. And so he turns to religion and to God in the form of Chang. Because Chang can pass judgment on Julian and remove the physical manifestation of those destructive impulses, his fists. Because after all, only God forgives. It's the title of the movie. 